Tell me what you love about New York City. Well, I was you know, I was born and raised in New York City. I, I grew up in Brooklyn. I live on Staten Island. I worked most of my career in Manhattan. I worked in the other boroughs. I worked in Brooklyn, Queens. I was an undercover in Queens. Um, when I started out in emergency service, we started in the Bronx. You know, it, it's it's a, it's a city that truly doesn't sleep. You know, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen here. Um, I embrace that. I, I embrace the meteor coverage of New York when something does happen. Um, it's just, to me, it's, it's, it's just the, it's such a vibrant place to be in. Tell me what it was like growing up in a city like New York. Well, I grew up in Brooklyn, you know, and, you know, we, and things were, you know, through this, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, the changes, you know, from the rock to the disco and Saturday Night Fever to, you know, listening to going to concerts in Central Park, you know, the Schaefer Series concerts and taking a train to, to Shea Stadium. And, you know, when you were nine, ten years old and, you know, we grew up, I had a large family, we had seven kids and, you know, really anybody with less than seven kids or five kids in their family, there was something wrong. So, you know, we, every block had their own softball team, every block had their own hockey team and we'd go out to Shea Stadium to go to a baseball game. My mother would say, well, so-and-so going? Well, I was nine and he was 10. So if he was 10, he was okay. So, but it was different then. Things have changed, obviously. But I think it's still, uh, if you, you know, I don't want to be too cliche, but if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere, right? Yeah. You know, every time I talk to somebody who was born and raised in New York, when they speak about the city, there's, there's a certain romance associated with and you can ask them you know would you have rather grown up in you know the beach of california or something they're like no there's no no place like home no and, and there are a lot of wonderful places you know and and there probably are some places where maybe the quality of life is a little bit better um but you, you do get used to it you get used to the fact that you can get a slice of pizza 24 hours a day or you can go to the beach you know, and then two hours later, you just kind of go upstate and go skiing in the same day. Similar thing like California. Sure. So. What drew you to public safety? You know, when I was going to college, I was majoring in business. I was looking to get into advertising, and um, and I had a motorcycle, and I got in a motorcycle accident, and I started working. So I had to kind of suspend my semester, and I started working security in a hospital. And my boss at the time was a retired first grade detective, and he had some wonderful stories. He was he was involved in a lot of the um, the Black Panther hmm. cases. So it it, it kind of made me want to become a cop. And I took the test. Took the the very first test was back I guess 1979, and I was called. I had 100 on the test, and my list number was very low, and. We went through the whole process, the whole medical process, and they called me up and they asked me how old I was. And they didn't think that they would know, but I was only 19 at the time and you had to be 20 to get in the class. My birthday was one day after the class was being put in. So I didn't get in that very first class in 1980, but then things happened for a reason, right? You know, you, you're in that class, maybe it's a different direction, maybe you're in a different place. So I always say, you know, sometimes the situation chooses you, you don't choose it. How was your experience going through the academy? It was fine. I actually went through the academy with the, as a transit cop and then transferred over and then did the academy, or a shortened version of the academy. You know, to me, the academy was fine. Um, we were actually up in the Bronx. We were, we took it over, taken over an old school. So um, it, was, it was an experience. You know, it was fine. The academy was fine. Tell me about the different roles that you've held within NYPD? Well, I started out as a transit cop, then I switched over, and I became, I worked in the Lower East Side. You know, I, I was a transit cop in Manhattan. I worked up in District 1, which was a, a busy place to work. It was up Columbus Circle. Then I became, um, when I switched over, I wanted to work on the Lower East Side. I wanted to be where it was busy. At the time, the 9th Precinct was one of the busiest precincts in the city, Alphabet City. Had a great, great time there. While I was there, I did a, a year working undercover as a narcotics officer, working in Brooklyn and Queens, doing buys. That was, um, that was kind of the Miami Vice days, so I was kind of living the dream back then, right? 
and went back to the precinct, went back to the 9th precinct. And my partner at the time said, oh, we got to take a ride up to truck one. I have to pick up an application. I said, an application for what? He said, ESU. I said, ESU. I said, who well, you know? And he, somebody we knew, and our, our, at the time, the head of the CEO of ESU was our former commanding officer of the 9th precinct. I said, why don't you get me one? So he got me one. It was just a simple one pager. You know, it looked like it had been copied 100, photocopied 100 times. Filled it out, put it in. And a year later, we got called and um, never looked back. And let's spend a little bit of time on ESU because I think, you know, a lot of folks outside of New York really don't understand the scope of responsibility. So explain to me what ESU is and what they do. You know, you probably, they've probably heard the saying, when somebody needs help, they call a cop, and when a cop needs help, they call ESU. And ESU stands for the Emergency Service Unit, and that's what we are, a service unit. We are, we are the, the last resort. You know, when I tell people, when I talk about emergency service, you, know, you talk about that yellow crime scene tape where police do not enter, well, that's for everybody else. That's not for ESU. We have a tact we're tactical. We're rescue, but we're a service. We're a service to the cop in the street who needs something, no matter what that might be. Simple as somebody's keys going down a, a sewer to a, a hostage situation, to a, a water rescue. Whatever it, it is, they're going to call us, and our only job is to get that job completed, right? to make that correct that condition. That's it. It's very simple. Whatever, whatever they need, we're there to do it. What I find fascinating about ESU is when you look at a lot of tactical specialty units within a law enforcement agency, they're very compartmentalized. You know, you have your SWAT team and they focus on barricade suspect, hostage rescue. If there is a threat of explosives, they have a bomb squad they call in, you know, but if it is a building collapse, if it is you know, extricating somebody from a vehicle, they call the fire department because they have the tools and the skill sets to do it. What's fascinating to me is all those are encompassed by ESU. So if you don't mind kind of sharing all the training that goes into what the ESU team provides. Sure. So, you know, the training, when I, when I went through the ESU, it's called Specialized Training School. It was a six-week class, and then they would bring you back for all the other additional specialized training, scuba, EMT, et cetera. The, the training school now is 10 months. You know, so the, the selection process is, is intense. And for the candidates to get through and to complete that 10-month course, it's, it, it, it says a lot about them. But you're being trained in... Tactics, of course, number one tactics. You're being trained, you're in repelling. All right? we, we repelled people at a, onto numerous jobs. Underwater search and rescue, scuba, hazmat, um, lock picking, auto extrication, lifting up trains, um, building collapses. You know, I, I, I tell a lot of people when they talk about 9-11 and they ask about how do you prepare for an event like 9-11, and you really don't. You know, but it's all those little other jobs that you've done in your career that give you that building block to, to handle or to respond to a 9-11 or a major type of catastrophe. You know, ESU is, is part of um, the FEMA, Urban Search and Rescue Teams. I was in Oklahoma City after the bombing. We spent about a week there. We covered a lot of um, victims. We have responded to other locations across the country and outside of the United States in support of whether it's a hurricane or some other type of natural disaster or man-made disaster. So the, the difference between us and, say, other police departments are that we, we do everything. We, we do everything. We don't just specialize in one thing. We work with the bomb squad in support of the bomb squad. We are not the bomb squad, but when the bomb squad's there, we're there. We're actually there to, to support the bomb squad and God forbid something does go wrong and to get them out as quickly as possible. We have um, sniper teams. We work closely with the Secret Service for dignitary. I've basically, I've provided security from everybody from the blind shake to the Pope. 
for every one of those details, whether it's a UN General Assembly or some type of visit. You know, it's always the issue. We're, we're in that motorcade. We're in that cat car, that counter assault team. Maybe it's just for me being in California, and, and I look at navigating through the city, you know, in response to a call that you guys might have. You know, being in a large, major metropolitan city, the biggest, you know, how does the topography pose a challenge to the team? Well, when I was working, we were still using maps. We didn't have GPS, and we really didn't have cell phones. So you, you kind of, if you got sent to another bar that you weren't that familiar with, you took out your Hackstrom, and, and your partner was reading the map trying to figure out how to get there. But, you know, you get around. You know, people would say, you know, I don't know how you can work in Manhattan with all this traffic, and I would say, I don't know how you can work anyplace else but Manhattan. You learn which streets to go, which streets are a little wider, which streets have wider sidewalks. Sometimes you have to take a street the wrong way, but we get there. We get there. You know, we've been on plane crashes at LaGuardia Airport, responding from Manhattan, and we've gotten there pretty quickly. What was your favorite part of the job? I, I liked all of it. You know, I, 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 I mean, I, I, I was kind of attracted to the scuba. You know, for me personally, um, I was always, you know, relatively good shape, runner, and the first time I took the scuba swim test, I didn't pass it. And it, this was probably 1988, and that was devastating to me. So I went and I took lessons, and, you know, I realized that you know, scuba swimming is, is not like running. You can run 10 miles, but sometimes you can't swim 100 yards. It's, 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 learned, it's a learned skill. And then um, I passed it and, and went on and, and became an assistant scuba instructor. Probably had you know a couple of hundred of the ESU guys come through class with me. So, I, I, scuba was something. Water rescues was something that I always, um, if I had to pick one, that was it. What was it about it? I mean, is it was it the challenge? Was it what specifically about scuba just was your your forte? Well, you know, scuba water rescue, saving a life is is you know this is. There's nothing like saving somebody's life, whether they've gone in the water intentionally to commit suicide or it's been an accident. And on the scuba team, you know, there's nothing worse than standing around and waiting for somebody else. So when you pull up on a scene and, and somebody has just gone under the water and you're, you're going in there and everybody else is looking at you, they don't know what's underneath there, you know, and there's a lot of, not, a lot of nasty stuff along the rivers within New York City. You know, people throw things in the river, it only goes so far. When people go out in the water and they submerge, they only get out so far. So you're kind of in the, in the middle of that. But it was just something that, you know, you were down there and you were on the end of that rope and you were looking to recover somebody and, you know, hopefully they maybe give them a chance to survive. You know, we had a lot of successful surface rescues. You know, we had a lot, um, you know, unfortunately when somebody goes under the water, it's, it's, it's very difficult to bring them back. You accept that, but if you can return that person, their family, you know, whether it's some kid in the Rockaways who got caught in a riptide, or it's you know a car who happened to go into the water, you know, off of a off of a pier, it's just something that it's the challenge, right? That, that that challenge, that that's something that not everybody does. It's very true. It's very very true. So September 11th, 2001. How did your day start? So I, I, I used to work steady 4 to 12s. My wife was a detective. She was in the homicide unit on Staten Island. So they worked kind of a, a, a different shift. So if we were both working the same 4 to 12, we would try to change our tour or something. So I was working 4 to 12 on September 10th. It was a quiet night. We were both scheduled to work 4 to 12 on September 11th. It was the first full week of school. It was a primary day. I said, you know what, I'm going to see if I can change my tour. And so I was able to change my tour to a midnight. So 4 to midnight, September 10th, and then midnight to 8 on September 11th. I figured, you know, the kids will be in school, I'll go home, I have no problem getting some rest. And she called me up later in the evening and said she, was being, she had a notification to go to federal court in Manhattan that I didn't have to change my tour. So I said, I already changed it. I'm not going to change it back. And that was it. And it was a very quiet night. The morning of, you know, from midnight to 8 o'clock in the morning on September 11th, it was a quiet night. I was, I was working inside that night. Um, normally, after working 16-hour shift, after working after midnight, you want to jump in your car and go home. 
So, it was, like I said, it was quiet. And we were guys the day tour was in. Um, we had a new piece of equipment. It was a window cutting tool, to take out windows from high rises. Brian McDonald, who was the younger, newer, the junior guy in the squad, you know, we had it on the table drinking coffee. The usual, you know, banter back and forth in the morning. And then I said, okay, I'm going. And it was about 8.45. And I walked down and they grabbed my keys off the board and the job came over the radio in the garage. Brian came down, the other guys came down. I ran up to my lock. I said, I'm gonna grab my stuff, jump in the back of the truck, the big ESU truck. I grabbed everything off my locker except pants. So I had a shirt, I had shorts on, which were jorts, which I hear coming back in style. And then I had my boots, my gun belt, my harness, helmet, etc. So as we're pulling out, I hit the intercom. I tell Sergeant, Sergeant Mendelaris, I don't have my pants. He said, I don't worry about it, you're not going to need them. Now, at the time, we didn't realize what type of plane this was. It wasn't just maybe a couple of months back where we had a small um, plane, a homemade type plane, hit the Statue of Liberty. There was a lot of activity always up and down the East River, uh, on the Hudson River with small planes. Um, and they were always flying low. We actually did a repel one time inside the World Trade Center where it was thir over 1,300 foot and repel from the roof down to B6. And we, we were up on the roof looking over the side and the planes were actually below us. So we were, the planes were closer to the ground than they were to us on the roof. So that's kind of what we thought until we got down there. And then things changed. When you got down there and you saw the, the gravity of the situation, what was the first thing that went through your mind? Well, I was in the back of the truck, so I didn't really see it until I got there. because There weren't any windows. And I jumped out and I was the senior person on the scene from my squad at that time when we arrived. And I didn't have pants on, so I became the truck one chauffeur. Cliff Allen was a chauffeur that day, and so he wouldn't be part of the team. So what I've learned from my experience in ESU, from the first World Trade Center, it was a lot of ad hoc type rescues. So people would respond, do what they had to do, go in. Some people climbed the stairs twice. We had you know teams that came and repelled onto the roof. Um, and if you look at any photos from that, it was a little more, uh, I, I guess, not chaotic, but maybe not as organized. So being in Oklahoma City after the bombing at the Mira building, it was a different type of response. It was a more structured. The teams were broken down into smaller teams, outfitted the same, you know, kind of each team had the same equipment. The idea was, you know, to get to a certain spot, and if you needed more, then you'd go back to where a different uh, additional equipment was staged, with cash of equipment, and then somebody else would get that equipment. So that was kind of my idea, right? I'm going to put teams in. Everybody's going to respond to me. I was the mobilization point, right, for ESU with that church in Bessie. And when they, teams would respond to me, I would put them in. When the ESU units respond to me, I'd put them on a team and then send them in. We knew there were three stairwells, right? And the idea was to get to those who needed us the most. And then, you know, just in the back of my mind, it was going to be those, you know, kind of at the impact zone. You know, how were we going to get above the impact zone? I, I requested aviation. I didn't know we already had a team from Floyd Benefield in Brooklyn already up in the air. Um, there was some discussion about that. If you read the 9-11 Commission report, there was some transmissions from some senior people in the department not to put anybody on the roof. <clears throat> but I always felt that that wasn't some, a decision to be made by some person in a car, regardless of his rank. It was a decision that had to be made by the pilots and the repel masters. You know, when you looked up at the tower, you could see the smoke blowing towards Brooklyn. There was a corner. We didn't know that the, the roof was locked, that there wasn't any access to the roof. But I was still, and I still feel, that it was the pilot's and the repel master's choice. So we would put the team in, put the first team in, which was the team from one truck, and that was the plan. We had a team in each staircase, start stripping equipment, lay it out, and, and then the second tower we got hit. So I radioed that information to the team. Now, I never knew it was a plan that hit the second tower, because I'm parked at church in Vesey. The north tower was close to West Street, the south tower was close to the church. The debris that came across rained down around us, you know, pieces of the, of the skin of the building and aircraft parts, et cetera. But you're, when you're in the middle of something, <clears throat> you, you're not focused on, you're just focused on what's happening right directly right in front of you. So 
the plan changed. Instead of putting three teams in the North Tower, is one team in the North Tower, one team in the South Tower. And that was my plan. As long as they were coming to me, each team would come and be, have a sergeant. And, you know, it's pretty much the same amount of guys, five or six guys, have breathing packs, um, harnesses, first aid equipment, breaching equipment, repel line, et cetera. And then they would get someplace and they'd say, okay, this is what we need. And we would get that to them. That was the, that's how the plan. What went through your mind when that second plane hit? I thought it was a bomb. I didn't know it was a plane, right? Like I said, it was this massive explosion and the, the, all the debris came north. So you couldn't see the plane. And, you know, we I just I wanted to let the team that was in the North Tower know. And they were like, okay, you know, just do, just do what you got to do. I was operating on two radios, a citywide frequency and a point-to-point -point frequency between myself and the teams that were in the building. So the next team that came in was, um, it was Sergeant Rodney Gillis, who had actually just finished the midnight tour in Brooklyn. And we put the guys on his team, and then they went into the South Tower. When you arrived on scene and you're organizing your groups and you're distributing equipment, did the thought of that building coming down ever cross your mind? Not of the whole building coming down. I was, I was expecting some, some uh, collapsing above the impact zones, you know, just from the way, the way the building looked and the way it was hit. Um, you know, you, I, you, you, what if this... I think that... I think that if somebody came up to us and said, I built this building and it's going to fall, and I transmitted that to the guys in the building, they would have just moved faster. That every single one of those guys would not have did on anything different. Yeah. Walk me through the collapse of building one or the first tower. So we're putting teams in, um, and, and, it, and it's going as planned, you know, a team in each staircase. Um, everybody's responding to me that should be responding to me. There were some teams that couldn't get to me because they were on uh, West Street, <clears throat> so they were setting up a second mobilization point. I had asked them to just keep track. We were setting up tactical, you know, we, we didn't know what else, you know, if there was any other issues that we needed to concern ourselves with tactically secondary attack or something on the ground. Um, <clears throat> one of the officers that was assigned to the South Tower, um, I happened to look over and see him over my shoulder. Now, there was another off-duty ESU for, a guy who worked in one truck, this guy, Billy Lutz, who happened to be working nearby I, I don't know, on an off-duty job, and he came over, and I happened to look over, and I saw this officer, his name was McCormick, and I looked at him and I was like, you know, what are you doing? Now I'm thinking this, this list of all of these teams and who they are and where they are is, is, is really not worth the paper that it's written on. And he sent that Sergeant Coughlin had sent him back to get a piece of a harness or something, some type of repel equipment, which didn't make sense because you know, they really didn't need it. Now, this uh, officer's father had been killed in emergency service some years back, the line of duty. <clears throat> so I looked at him and I said, Stay here. We'll get you on another team. And that's when I, I raised each team and asked them who was on the team and where they were. And that's when I saw Gillis he responded back to me that they were in the opposite staircase, 20-something floor, South Tower heading up. They were having a difficult time making it up because of the amount of people on the stairs. I had the transmissions from the teams in North Tower, so I knew everybody was where they were supposed to be. I told him Kwong, I'd get him on another team. I'd say in less than, less than 10 minutes, the South Tower collapsed. Sergeant Coughlin sent him back because he knew this, this wasn't going to be good. You know, his mom has already lost her husband, and this wasn't going to be good. So, you know, he, he had a um, guardian angel watching over him, so to speak. If I didn't see him, then he would have not been with the team, but he would have been in the in the debris field of the South Tower. When the tower came down, obviously, you know, it's nothing that anybody, it's nothing that anybody could prepare for, but 
how did you, how did the mission change? So if you remember that day, it was a, it was a beautiful September day. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. And we were putting together the teams. And we were in church in Vesey. And like I said, the South Towers close to the church. And then you just heard this tremendous roar. And it went from a clear day to, 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 to gray, to dark gray, to black. I, I, I actually had to crawl underneath the truck. I didn't have a mask or a respirator or anything on. I was starting to transmit to the people in the North Tower. When all that debris came and it settled, um, our communications were, were working well. You know, one of the things that we're, we're most proud of is that we maintained a good c control. Right? Our command center and our communications and our response to our mobilization points is what saved a lot of lives as opposed to people just going in and without being organized and not knowing where everybody was. So the comms was still working. The people, the teams in the North Tower didn't know that the South Tower had collapsed. They felt a shake. But remember, each floor of the World Trade Center was an acre. And unless you were near a window, and you were somewhere internally, you didn't see what happened. So when I transmitted to them um, to evacuate, they heard that order and they started coming down, still searching on the way down. And the other team three was Sergeant Curtin's team was working on uh, providing aid to another victim. So they were requesting assistance. So I was trying to direct team one to team three, all the while trying to raise the other teams that are in the South Tower on the radio. You know, that was consistent. You know, Sergeant Coughlin's team on the air, Sergeant Curtin's team on the air. Um, so when <coughs> Sergeant Curtin said, that they got the person out, that they didn't need any assistance from direct team one from ESU, saw Sergeant and Larry's team out. And then he, um, the North Tower collapsed. So, we, again, that continuous, you know, so and so on the air, then I didn't know it, um, it was what. So, second tower comes down. What then becomes the mission? So the ESU command post is probably the only post that remained intact throughout both collapses. Right? So we were at church in Vesey. South Tower collapsed. We're evacuating people from the North Tower. North Tower collapses. When the, when the South Tower collapsed, there was a lot of debris on the street. When the North Tower collapsed, a lot of that debris turned went on fire. So we had a lot of ESU trucks that were on fire. A lot of these trucks carry a lot of ammunition. So we were trying to get those, that, those fires out. And then we relocated one block up to the Woolworth building. And that's where all the off-duty personnel were coming. And that's where we regrouped to put teams together to start searching for people. All the while, you know, asking over the air, so on, on the air, you want so-and-so on the air, and just waiting to get some feedback. The biggest challenge of, of you know, making those, that second entry into the site was lack of communications. Not, we did, not every single ESU officer had their own radio. So you had, a, you know, maybe you had 15 radios in the truck and another four or five, uh, 15 at the command and another four or five on the truck. Well, as people were coming in, you maybe have one radio for eight people. So you, your efficiency is, is not that good, right? Because you don't want to separate. We spent a lot of time in the, in the, uh, in the weeks after 9-11 looking for people who decided that, you know, they had to take a break or they went to get something to eat and then they were, the team couldn't find them. So we had, afterward, you know, we created a buddy system. Me and you, you go somewhere, you let me know. If you're not here, I ask you, and so on and so forth. So, but we, did, we had to get back in there, right? We knew we had guys in there. Um, and that's what we did. We put teams together, we started, and we ended up going south. <clears throat> we set up a temporary command post um, uh, just off of Liberty Street. And then we worked from there up until the, the recovery of... Um, Port Authority offices. Tell me about that, if you don't mind. So they had received some information of the uh, Port Authority offices that were trapped, and they were pretty much almost in the center of the complex. And we were working, and we were on now the south side of the complex off Liberty Street, coming from the South Tower. So we had teams in there. Um, there were um, 
TSU personnel, there were fire personnel, and he had two officers, uh, a sergeant and uh, an officer and another officer that were trapped and was near an elevator. So they were working very diligently to get them out in, in, in very, 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 very difficult conditions. And we were trying to resupply them. And they would ask for pieces of equipment, you know, and heavy equipment. And they just said, well, we weren't going to be able to get that to you. You know, you're going to have to do this by hand. So we have kind of made our way up over the, the, the pile and back down to the middle where they were. Um, we talked about having medical teams for, you know, to, to possibly do an amputation to get them out. You know, and, and the, the guys worked really well. You know, Scott Strauss, Patty McGee, they, um, they were given the Medal of Honor for that. And when they passed the first Port Authority, uh, Willie up, you know, it was dark. And there was still secondary collapses throughout the site. There were a lot of fires. And like I said earlier, I was wearing shorts. So I was, able, I was feeling this heat coming through the steel. And we had a limited amount of Scott packs. We didn't have any, a lot, any, really any more flashlights left. Um, and they passed Willie up, and Willie, Willie just looked up and he said, "Look what these look what these motherfuckers did." He had no idea, right? We got Willie out, and Scott Strauss came up to me and said, "Kenny, it's John McLaughlin." And we knew John. We trained with him. We had trained with him at the World Trade Center. He was a Port Authority issue sergeant. He says, "You got to get him out." Scotty was shot. Everybody's out. I grabbed what Scott, there was one Scott pack left. I started, I, I started going down, really couldn't see much. And then kind of had an area where I saw a lot of tools and um, you could see where they were working. And I really couldn't see John. So I, I climbed back up. There was a big beam that we were working on. I climbed back up and I happened to look from the Church Street side and I saw all these flashlights coming through the smoke. You know, I didn't even, could, it looked like something, and I tell people it looked at it something like at a, at a VT, right? These, these flashlights coming through the fog. I said, who is this, right? Well, you know, and it was the issue guys. And they were coming in, and I said, it's Tom O'Glock, and you go down here, and you go in about 15, 20 feet. And they worked to get him out like 7, 7.30 in the morning. And then when we walked out, we walked out the same direction that they came in, and it was like a 10-minute walk. <laughs> I said, it took us 45 minutes to go the other way, and it took us 10 minutes to go out this way. And then we went back, went back to, uh, got back to the truck about two o'clock in the morning. And took a shower and woke up the next morning, couldn't open up my eyes. Myself and another officer, we went to the Iron Ear Hospital, spent a couple hours at the Iron Ear Hospital, and then we went back down to the site. When you went back down to the site, <clears throat> was it still, in your mind, a rescue, or did you know going forward it was probably gonna be more recovery? Well, you always have hope, right? You know, I spent, um, I was in a lot of voids. You know, I, I actually was in a void at one time where we made entry and it was a room and it was probably a break room for some maintenance personnel. And there was a desk and a locker and a pair of boots and a cup of coffee still in this room. And everything else around this room had been collapsed. You know, so you're always holding out hope. I mean, the, the, the collapse was a pancake-type collapse. It was, was catastrophic, you know, a hundred and something stories. Um, but there's always hope. There's always hope for a void. And, and, and that's kind of what we hung on. You know, we, um, we, maybe a few days after, I was talking to one of the sergeants. And, you know, it's, it, it's a little chaotic. It's, it's something that, you know, really nobody has ever, you know, in any agency. Is really um, handled. So we were in the process of you know creating grids, and I told him, I, said, I, I know where all the guys were. Well, I had the list. I mean, I lost the list, but then I wrote it down again. I lost it after the first collapse. Then I wrote it down again. So this um, Timmy Farrell, he got a, a blueprint of the site, and we plotted where each team was, who was on their team, and where their last known location was. And for the most part, aside from, you know, the precinct personnel, um, the issue officers that were recovered, and we still have not recovered all of them, unfortunately, were in their last scene location. So, you know, we, we, we knew, I mean, it was going to be a point where it's going to be designated as a, as a recovery. But, you know, 
bringing somebody back to their family to give some sense of closure was very important to us. And the way I feel is we still haven't, we haven't satisfied that mission yet. Hopefully with you know, new technology, et cetera, you know, they'll be able to return their loved ones back to them for proper, proper service. But it was, uh, you know, we were there, you know, it was, when you went home, you, you couldn't wait to get back there the next day because you wanted to be there. And then you, when you got there in the morning, you couldn't wait till the day was over because hopefully you would have found something or somebody. Right. And, and, and that's what we did. We did, we worked 12 hour shifts. You know, we had our, um, our day job that we had to handle. We had our, we had our teams at, at the site every day. We had the heavy de security details for the mayor and, and, and his personnel. And then eventually we had those hazmat, those anthrax jobs. So it was a, it was a busy time. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. Something that I'm willing to bet you might not have experienced the same way as the rest of the United States. You know, we have, we've heard it said, you know, nobody would ever wish for another September 11th, but could use another September 12th. Just explain to me how the city and the country brought you into their arms. Well, it was everything from just, you know, driving down there along West Street and, and people standing there waving flags as, as you went down to the site, to the local, you know, community, which is still the Gramercy Park Civic, Civic Association, which where Truck One, where I worked, encompasses, they, they basically adopted the cops from the precinct. You know, the 13th Precinct lost two offices, Moira Smith was one of them. I grew up with Moira's sister, and I knew Moira. We used to, she was a few years younger than me, but we would go on camping, canoeing trips, and she'd have her friends and our, our group, and, but we all knew each other, and her partner um, were killed. So that, that community embraced us, but unlike a lot of other um, organizations, they didn't leave after 9-11. They still support the cops very strongly, and particularly in the last year. They've, the Gramercy Park Civic Association has been a big supporter of ESU and of the 13th Precinct. You know, I hate to say it, but you know, in some places you almost have like a rock star status, right? You know, we had teams from all over the country that came here and assisted with the search and rescue, but it was still ours, right? You know, we were never, coming from New York, we were never the ones that had to ask for help. We never asked for mutual aid. We always responded to somebody else's request, whether it was a law enforcement or, or, or whatever it might be, or a hostage job in Yonkers or a rescue job or some a protest job in New Jersey somewhere. We responded. We didn't have somebody come to us. So that was, that was difficult. Right, and, and you know, we, we know you couldn't do it yourself, but we, we always felt that we could do anything by ourselves. And then there was a lot of support, you know, a lot of phony support, a lot of photo ops for a lot of people. And you, you kind of saw it through that. You know, people would come down to the site and have their picture taken. And there was nothing, it wasn't something I was really a fan of, but I had, we had other things to focus on, right? So yeah, I, I think we did have a lot of support. It, it was an it was an attack, you know, on America, not just on New York. A lot different than the '93 attack. Let's put it that way. '93 attack was it was contained within the building. Arrests were made pretty quickly. You know, the the job was over. You know, and the port authority resumed operations in, within a couple of months. This was different. Yeah. <clears throat> And speaking, you know, about the community support, especially going into last year, my last question that I have for you is, you know, there's a, there's a lot of people in the world today who weren't even alive when September 11th occurred. What would you tell them about the men and women in service that day? They didn't, you know, when everybody's running out, we're running in. We didn't care what color you were. We didn't care what your religious beliefs were. We, we just were in there to, to save lives. And if an event like that happened again, and a lot smaller events happen like that all the time, we're going to respond the same way. You know, we're, we're going to put our lives in jeopardy to save your life. And, and that's what we do. 
You know, we, we, we run into the we run into the bullets, we run into the fire, we run into the flames. We don't run away from them. And you know, I don't think a lot of people understand that until they're in a position where they need help. And then all of a sudden, it's you know, you, you can't get there fast enough. So it, it was a pile, and you know, I was there from when it was a pile to just before the site closed when we were at the basement floor. You know, we went from climbing up to climbing down. Um, when you were working there, you know, it's something that could never have been done without the construction workers and the heavy machinery. There were shifts, and they would, you know, reach and scrape and claw and lift, and we'd get in there, and, you know, the smells of, of, um, of the bodies of the victims was, it was overwhelming at times. Um, it was, there were layers, and you would see when layers were pulled away, you know, floors that were 10, 12 feet high, compacted into, you know, maybe six inches or eight inches. And when you pull that stuff out, you would find material in there. And, you know, whether it was a letter or something, you kind of knew what floor you were working on. And, and, that, and that's all we could do. We would, and the teams would go in, the, the site was divided up into sectors, and then you would work on that site and you would keep going. When, you know, on, on, some, on one of the recoveries of uh, Binny Dan's, I had been working in a truck that day, and I think there was a service going on from one of the other offices upstate. So we were covered by, we, we still had a, a team down there, but we had um, correction officers, state police, Port Authority police, and we had received the call. We were just running my truck only, which is just um, one truck that day because of the service, and we have recovery. So we raced down there, and I had kind of what's called like soft shoes, almost like a, a referee type shoe on, because I was working inside that day. Well, they actually melted. The bottoms were melted. And we had recovered Vinny. Vinny was up against the wall. And I believe it was the next day, day after that, they recovered his partner, Joe, who had been knocked to almost the ground level. So, you know, when, when we were working at the site, just going back to that, they were in the North Tower. We found them in the South Tower, the brief field. And I have communications with their sergeant that they were in the South Tower, a North Tower, you know, so they actually got, you know, come and blown out into that debris field. So, you know, there was areas within the, within the site that sometimes became a little bit more accessible. You know, a machinery would rip something apart and you'd see a void and you'd crawl through there and you'd get those strong odors, et cetera. But a lot of times it was just lingering. Uh, but, you know, that's just what it was. You went in there every single day hoping to be able to find something. Not, not just, you know, my guys, but, you know, of the other, you know, 2,700 of those victims that passed away on that day to return something to the families. And we did. You know, we, we found a lot of stuff. Fortunately, sometimes you couldn't tell what, or whether it was debris or if it was something human unless you smelled it. But it was, you know, every day, a lot of work. The site just, pilots got lower and lower and lower. It was the response in 93 was wherever you showed up, you and your partner went in, and, you know, it wasn't really organized. There wasn't a good command and control structure. The communications wasn't that great. So, and that was more internal. You know, it was in the sub-basement where it didn't, and the, the upper floors were affected more by smoke than there were any, there was no collapses or anything on the upper floors. 9-11s, <clears throat> you know, it was, it was more visual because it was external. You could see it from the street. And, you know, the concern was, you know, the people below, yes, but the people, the impact zone and above. And that, and that's what was, you know, we felt that those are the people that we had to get to. And how do we get to them, you know, which, which was going to be the biggest challenge. I, I was expecting, you know, some interior structural collapses, but not the collapse of the entire building. If I'm wearing my full uniform that day, you know, like I should have, I should have had with me, then maybe I'm not the truck one chauffeur. If I didn't do the tour change, then I'm responding back in the morning when I when I see it on TV, and maybe I'm one of the teams that goes to the South Tower, right? You, you know, what what if I don't? 
what if I don't take charge? I was just a cop. I wasn't a boss. You know, if you read the 9-11 Commission reports on, on the response, you know, it, it, it highlights that. But people came to me, <clears throat> you know, because we were, we had good command and control, uh, you know, and I could see every one of those guys' faces. I remember that, you know, when the guys from 7, when Ronnie and Santo pulled up, the, their brakes were, were smoking. And they came from East New York. You know, they, they, you could smell the, the, the brakes. They were almost, uh, I'm sorry, they didn't go on fire. Other trucks pulling up, you know, coming to me. And you tell somebody they were on a team. And it was no like, oh, I don't want to be on that team. Well, I'm not going in. It was like, okay. Every single one of them. You know, when, when, when Sergeant Curtin of Two Truck, when they showed up, he, he, Sergeant uh, Curtin was a former Marine uh, sergeant. And he had a, uh, a tactical mindset. So when him and his driver, John Delara, pulled up, they had the heavy vest on, uh, heavy weapons. And I, and I said to him, you know, we can't go tactical here. You're never going to get up 70 flights of stairs with his vest on. And, you know, John was trying to take some heavy equipment, airbags or something out of the back of the truck. I said, just get to where you got to get, and we'll get the other stuff to you. But uh, Sergeant Curran kept his MP5 submachine gun with him at the whole time. He was recovered. We recovered him. He still had his machine gun strapped across his chest. What, I think what, what, what separates us from other police officers, whether it's in New York or anyplace else, is just our training. You know, we're no better. We're just trained better. You know, we have, we have a, a, a skill set, and, and, and like I said earlier, you can't train for this type of event. But all those jobs that you do every day, you know, these, these, these 14 officers and the other officers, you know, the 23 of them, the 37 police officers, all the firemen, it, 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 they're not recognized just for what they did on 9-11. They recognize what they did, you know, their entire careers. This was just a, another job, a big job, amongst many other jobs, many other rescues, many other lives saved, many other people helped. And, you know, it, it just wasn't a, you know, we're not just recognizing, um, for what they did on that day. We're recognizing what they did their whole careers, their whole lives.